Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. Uh, please welcome Dr. Angela Grace. Angela, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Angela, I want to bring you on to talk about mental health, and I want to start my line of questions off with this important question, because I think it will get to the crux of what the conversation is going to be like over the next uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. What is mental health to you? Oh my goodness, that is such a loaded question. Um, mental health would be a combination of how a person approaches the world, how a person approaches their day to day life, their attitude, their well being, and also how they respond um, to different situations in their life. So one could say that um, a person with stable mental health would approach things with greater ease that they would you know, plan, plan their day for health and well-being. They would approach people with friendliness and kindness. They would approach problems with, hmm, I wonder how we're going to solve that. And so there's just this sense of ease and flow, even when there's struggles, even when there's problems. Um, in no way am I gonna say that mental health means a person is happy all the time. I think that's, I think we need to approach all of our feelings. Um, so it's not, it, mental health isn't about happiness, but mental health is about being reasonable and approaching your life with a way that says, you know what, I'm resilient and I can handle the setbacks. And, oh, this, this is a season, you know, like for example, when my grandma died, it was a season of grief. When my dog died, it was a season of grief. So it's recognizing and looking after yourself through those challenging times and then approaching life with, with friendliness and kindness and resiliency and effort. So that, that's how I would approach mental health. And when I, when I listen to my clients' stories, that's what I'm listening for. I'm listening for where are they, where are they stuck that they can't seem to get through and what, what things have impacted them um, on a body, mind, spirit, relational level that, that we can, we can help resolve and move through. So yeah. that's, that's how I'd look at it. Now you are a registered psychologist and I want to, I, I yes. well, I don't want to put you in an awkward position to talk about patient confidential, patient, client, uh, client, client, patient uh, confidentiality. And I would never want to uh, ask you any questions that would uh, hurt you in any way. I'm going to ask. I'll you, never answer them anyway, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that <laughs> that way. I want to ask this question though. And this is the yes. question that I think a lot of people are struggling with right now. Over the last few years, and I would say over the last two and a half years since the March 2020, uh, the global pandemic of COVID-19, mm -hmm. there has been a lot of talk about mental health. There's been a lot yes. of talk about ensuring that your mental health is looked after, whether it be through conversations like you and I are having right now, whether it be through exercise, whether it be through this, that, or the other. How important... Is it because we are, and I, I say this with respect, but not all certainty, we are at the end of COVID. We are in this new period of transitioning out of the post, the every day everyone has to be in their house to being able to go out, go out, unmask, be with a mask, however you want to look at it. How important is it in this post pandemic world that we are entering? to properly get a check of your mental health? Well, first I'm going to say I'm not, like you, I'm not convinced that we're out of it. I'm not, I'm not fully convinced. I'm not fully yeah, convinced. No. I'm, it's one of these, uh -huh. I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I don't yeah. know how far the tunnel is until I and exit it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I think... So it's interesting, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, I believe that the CTV News asked me to come on and just do a little spot about mental health and resiliency. So, so I did, and at the time I was like, okay, you know, you need to look after your family. You know, these are some of the things that you can do. Well, it, part of what we're seeing now is people are fed up. People are, are 
are fed up, they're confused. The in and out of mandates, um, in and out of masking has been really confusing for people. You know, there's research showing they're helpful, research showing they're not helpful. You know, I, I also did another interview um, for the Western Standard about the impact of, of lockdowns and mandates on mental health. And the truth is, it's this broad spectrum of some people go in the flow and they're they're like okay this is what i need to do for now and we're okay other people are really resistant to it and and it's really angering to them so now we've got this huge divide and honestly i think the biggest thing that we need to do right now is acknowledge where we're kind we're in a mental health mess and we're in a relational mess right now with tremendous division and one of the most important things that we can do is put kindness first. Like we need to go back to the golden rule that we learned in kindergarten, treat others as you would like to be treated. And it may mean not talking with people for a little bit. It may mean settle in and simmer down. Um, I know, get off social media. I know there's, and get off social media for sure. I know there's days when I am when I'm just angry and I am not fit for human consumption. So if you're not fit for human consumption, go have a nap, go for a walk, watch a favorite movie, go have a hot shower, like just chill out because you're not going to be beneficial to yourself or anybody by, by stirring things up. Right. So I, I do think we need, and I'm going to use the word reset. I know that that's, you know, a loaded word for some people. So I don't mean a great reset. I just mean your own, come back to yourself, look after your family, look after what you need to do to, to be okay. Um, you know, I, and I want to interject here for a second. Ahead, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a statement that you just made that I want to make sure I clarify before we move on. And you, and you, yeah. these are these, I, I wrote these words down because I found it quite interesting. You said we're in a mental health mess. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Be, like, what do you mean by that? Because mess, to me, that means that no one's able to get the proper help that they need if they're looking for a psychologist. They're not able to get their yeah. proper uh, treatments if they're going if going to see the doctors. They're not able to properly express themselves. It just, mess to me seems like a very loaded uh, statement. We talk about <laughs> the word reset being a loaded question, uh, word. <laughs> To me, mess is a loaded word. So I just want to clarify okay. what do you mean by what do you mean by mental health mess? Okay. Well, what I what I mean is um people are really suffering right now. Like I'll I'll give you an example of I I have heard of a person, or yeah, I've heard of a person who said, I am terrified of living in a world with COVID. Um, I want medical assistance and dying. And so what I mean by mess is things have become so severe and so exaggerated for some people. And I don't mean exaggerated for attention. I mean, just very severe. And prior to COVID, there were some streams for mental health that, that took a long time for people to get in. So I know there's, oh shoot, I've forgotten the name of it. There's, um, a mental health hotline. And so people can call into the hotline and they'll divert them to different services. Well, prior to COVID, it was taking six to nine months for people to get in. So if that was prior to COVID and now mental health and health has increased, those that stream is now 12 months and beyond. So you can call and, and need help and not have not have the finances or extended healthcare benefits to pay for private services. So you do need to go through the public services. And it, it's, it's like, yeah, we'll see you in a year. Here's the distress center, right? And so we have these, like we have the, um, the hotlines to call. So like the distress center, the kids help phone, we have these and those are very, like they're a short term, 15 maybe 20 minute phone call to help people get out of a crisis and they're overloaded right now and then we have the the or access mental health that's what it's called it's a really important service with alberta health um but now 
it's taking 12 months and longer for people to get in. Um, myself, I'm in private practice, so people can use their extended health benefits. I, I have never been so busy and I have never had to turn people away before. And so it breaks my heart to tell people, I'm sorry, I am over capacity and I need to refer you refer you elsewhere. But then I when I refer people elsewhere, they're often very busy as well. So it, it's interesting, like you, you, you introduced me that my, you know, my PhD was in the prevention and treatment of eating disorders and body image issues. And so from that, we have to look at prevention is more cost effective than treatment. So we really do need people to look at their own prevention for mental health mental health issues. But at the same time, some of those aren't good enough. Like doctor, you know, it's, it's great. Yes, I fully believe that exercise is, is an important way to manage your mental health. Um, you know, go for, a, go for a good run or a swim or something, burn off the adrenaline, like get yourself into a calmer state of mind. But the truth is we can't, we can't always rely on that. And now for some people, and, and I'm going to put myself in that category. So I have long COVID. I got COVID in February. I've had, so it's now nine months for me. And my exercise that I used to be able to do for mental health, I can't do anymore because of my lung capacity and my heart. So I've had to find other ways and start to make peace with that. Like I can no longer go for a good run. I can no longer go for a good swim. I have to find other ways um, to move that through through my system. And I know, I know I'm not alone in that. So part of the issue that we're dealing with now is the mess that we're in has been a long time of confusing in and out of mandates. It's been a long time of now um, our, our healthcare system being, being overloaded and mental health systems being overloaded. And now we also have the additional issue of the neurological and mental health effects of people having had COVID and dealing with the brain inflammation. And I'm sorry, you can't deal with the brain inflammation um, and the neurological symptoms that have happened from, from people having COVID. You can't deal with that by thinking positive. You can't deal with that by going, you know, going for a good run. You can't deal with that um, with, like, yes, you do need to have a tremendous amount of self-compassion and patience, but at the same time, your, your body and your brain have changed and we need to, we need to do the studies and do the, and do the work on how we can actually help people deal with this. Like I will give an example of a child, um, you know, not able to go to school because of having a severe migraine and parents going out of their minds because this kid's not going to school. The doctors are saying it's all in their head. And then I come along and say, when did your child have COVID? Well, in March, 2022. Well, when did their migraine start? April, 2022. So I said, we're dealing with, we're dealing with inflammation and it's going to be, it, it's going to be a challenge to, to move past this. You know, the other th thing I've seen with kids is the development of this existential fear of death, um, existential, like from separation anxiety, afraid that their parents are going to die, um, afraid, afraid of going to school and not seeing, not seeing their parents, um, developing eating disorders as a way to cope with it, developing hand washing habits, um, because because we teach kids, if you're sick, wash your hands. Well, if they're afraid of being sick, maybe if I wash my hands 50 times, then it'll relieve the anxiety. So that's why I'm saying we're, we're in a mess because there's, there's, not, there's, there's not enough mental health prevention and health promotion information going out to the public on the things to do to look after your mental health. Um, there's, there's not enough treatment right now we're also in like prior to this we had op opioid crisis and addictions that we needed um we needed more supports for and so now what's happening is people are suffering and of course 
wanting an escape. So it's actually more challenging now. So we really need to look at the evidence-based best practices of how people can prevent issues, can manage them, um, and then how we can how we can treat some of the most severe. And I was already treating a lot of PTSD prior prior to COVID. And now it's so much more. So there's a few things I want to unpack with their statement. Yeah. And I want to, I'm going to talk about prevention a little bit later here in this, this episode, but I want to start with this and this might be a controversial segment. So please, That's okay. please bear with me while I ask this question in the most appropriate, not appropriate way that I can. And that is the rise of social media, the rise of online news, online resources is giving a rise to outlets and professionals and people who want to, who say they want to help, but may not have the teaching, the resources like someone in your yeah. field has. Yeah. So yeah. while we try to battle back and try to fix the mess that's there, fixing the mess doesn't just start with the patients, but it also starts with the information that's out there. And the information out there right now is saying what you're saying is wrong. What I'm saying is right. What they're saying is wrong. What I'm saying is right. So how do we battle back against the misinformation, but also the negative, negative information that people are getting and then using that information to try to fix themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So what you're talking about is something called confirmation bias. And what it is, is we all come, you know, we're born into families and our families have, have ideas and values and, and ways, ways of being that we, that we take on. And, and so that's, that's what we're moving into here is we've got these values and We've got people wanting, you know, wanting freedom and wanting, you know, to do their own thing and wanting their independence. And, and, you know, I don't want some, I don't want someone telling me what to do. So I can, I can absolutely respect that because I don't want those things either, but we have to, we have to step back and just say, we're in unprecedented times here and it's not going to help anybody with, with all the fighting. And with holding firm to a belief that maybe, maybe doesn't serve anymore. But what confirmation bias is, it's saying, well, I think this. So I'm going to find all the articles and all the things that say that align with what I think. And that's my proof. Well, you know, and, and that's, what, that's what going through grad school and my PhD taught me very firmly is that there are no absolutes. And we have to look at all the pieces of information and arrive at the best possible decision. And what's hard is people are really, really stuck, stuck in their views. And it's hard, it's hard to shift that. So, so how do you I shift that do... when you have, when you're trying to deal with prevention? Because I think that's, that's yeah. where I'm getting stuck here because there is a lot of confirmational bias that is out there. Like, don't get me wrong. There's yeah. things that me and my husband fight about all the time because I'm like, well, we did it this way in my family. So it has to be done this way. There's people out there who will say the exact opposite. How do you battle back and get to the prevention matter when there is yeah. so much confirmational bias out there that people are just not even worrying about the prevention part of the aspect of it because they're so entrenched in the confirmational bias of this is how I'm going to prevent it my way, not you, the, not the way that it should be done, yeah. but the way I believe it should be done. Exactly. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story of what happened in grad school for me. So I was doing my, I was doing my research on eating disorder prevention in schools and a just short story of how I got there was I used to be a teacher. I was a grade one teacher. And one year something was off with my little grade one girls and I caught one of them throwing out her lunch. 
And when I caught her, I said, what, what are you doing, honey? And she said, oh, we started a diet club to be like our moms. And they were throwing out their lunches at recess and running or behind my back and running laps around the playground at recess to try to lose weight. And I, as a teacher, had nothing nothing in my teacher training to help these little girls. So that's why I went back to school and focused on eating disorder prevention. So that was the start. And what happened was it grew into this great big funnel, uh, just this expanding story of it's not just prevention of eating disorders, it's comprehensive school health. And how do we do health promotion for all children um, in a school setting when all their families have all these different beliefs? right? And, and then teachers are like, oh, well, we have to prevent obesity. So we're going to take away all the kids snacks. And it, it's like, mm, those aren't quite the right things. So we have to look at what is the best practice messaging to help people understand why we need to do things a certain way. Okay. So for example, if I was going to go onto a construction site, um, I walk onto the site and they say, hey, you have to put this, this hard hat on. Well, I don't want to mess up my hair. So why do I have to put a hard hat on? Well, if they explain to me, you're going to be moving past equipment and, you know, something could happen. So we need to keep you safe. Okay. That makes sense to me. I'm willing to mess up my hair for that. What's, what's happening now is there's so much mixed information and, and our, if we look at our, you know, occupational health and safety, are not giving, like our provincial health and safety are not giving us the information. And I'm gonna say it, it's because they're towing, they're towing a political line to impress people. And it's, it's really, it's really, um, so going back to my research, what the outcome was is that nothing changes and no prevention, no health promotion happens if those at the top don't believe it to be real or important. So I, as a teacher, went in and said, hey, these little girls are starting to have eating disorders at age six. And at the school, they're like, kids don't have body image problems. Kids in grade four don't worry about that stuff. And I'm like, no, they actually, they actually do. And so it takes a lot of, of talking and um, good evidence that says, yeah, we actually need to take health promotion and health prevention very seriously. You know, how much I hate, I hate going to the dentist, but I still go once a year or once every six months to get my teeth cleaned. Right. Yeah. We I have want, to do the prevention things. I want to go back to the, the the situation that you addressed the child who threw out their lunch because they want to be like their mother i am a proponent of social media has been the downfall of our society i've said that since day one of the show and i believe it to this day i think it I, is a i align with you on that i it is a double-edged sword it's a good way to connect with people but Kids today, and I, I sound like the my husband's going to laugh so hard when he listens to this episode because I'm saying the same thing he says to me every single time I say this, but kids today have it harder than I had it. They had it, and I had it harder than my parents had it, and so on yes. and so forth. Social media has been a crux of body image, mental health. If you don't get the like, if you don't have the followers, if you don't have the blue check mark on Twitter, you're not important. How much in is social media playing a factor into our mental health in today's society, do you think? Well, I think that's part of the problem right now is because we were so isolated at the beginning of the pandemic um, that people needed some kind of access some kind of access to socialize, to, to be with other people, to look at something, to, to be engaged, to keep their brains engaged. And I'll tell you, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, it was probably about hmm, eight months in or so, my husband said to me, you're on your phone a lot. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, looking, at, I'm looking at Facebook. And then it was, oh, I found this group that I really like, so I'm chatting with them. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, 
you're right. I am on social media way too much. And it's because I do want, like, I'm a chatty person. I like, I like to talk with my friends. I'm not going out with, with people. I'm, this is what I'm doing. And then, so I just quit for a while and I realized it was all fake relationships. It was like, yes, I was part of this group and yes, we were chatting about things, but when I quit talking on it, nobody reached out to me. Two years later, I don't even remember some of the conversations. I'm like, yeah, it was, it was false. So yeah, social media, although, although there are some, some good things like you and I connected on Twitter, like that was great. If we use it at the, as those little touch points, that's fine. Like, Hey, this is interesting. And now how does it apply to my life? Fine. But man, you can go down the rabbit hole that just takes you to really really dark places and it's overwhelming right like when I went to school you could go to the library and you were allowed to take out three books so you take out three books you read them you return them now with social media it's like you can take out a million things and not be able to not be able to really sink in to what one of them is telling you it's just this over bombardment and also, you have to think about, like I've got my phone right here. If you think about scrolling, scrolling down, your eyes are darting all over a tiny little screen. The blue light is impacting your pineal gland in your brain. And it's actually creating this false, almost like ADHD, where people can't concentrate. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Um, people want things in 30 seconds or less. And that's just not a way to sink in and understand a situation. It's just not possible to do that. I, so, I jokingly say on the show, like we try to go beyond the 15 second sound bite because yeah. when I was a reporter, the 15 second sound bite was like the long, like, oh God, you have a, like, you have a 20 second sound bite. That's huge. Like no one's going to listen to 20 yeah. seconds. And I'm like, you know what? We, we don't give people credit. I believe, and I think this is just me here, and I could be completely mm -hmm. up creek without a paddle, but I think people want to go back to the days of when they could actually get something out of something. The rise of TikTok, yes. the rise of the Twitter of 200 or 400 or however many characters there are on Twitter, the 20-second dance compilation on TikTok, the Facebook post, the Instagram mm -hmm. likes. People, I think, are going away from that because – like you said, we've been locked. We've been in these mandates. We've been up and down through mandates over the last two years. People are willing to come back. Mm -hmm. I can tell you through just from doing this show, we've never had more views, listens, likes, all that than we've ever had since probably about the summer of last year. And I think it's because people are finally getting fed up with social media and the instant gratification that they're willing to sit down and actually listen to an hour long conversation mm -hmm. between two people and go, you know what? It's something I can put on the background while I'm doing dishes and I can actually learn something and I'm not exactly. scrolling through Twitter. So yeah. I agree wholeheartedly there. Wholeheartedly. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've, you know, I, I could go down the rabbit rabbit hole on, on Twitter as well. I only joined Twitter in December um, for political reasons, actually for, for education and and mental health and to be you know to be be a source of educated expert information um, and it's really it's it's really interesting um, people are asking for it like people are asking for expert expert perspectives and 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 ways of doing things but then there are also those people that don't because of their confirmation bias and it's, I just have to keep going back to what are my ethics? What are the standards of practice? And how can I be grounded solidly in, you know, in, in being, being principled and professional the best I can? Um, you know, not, not, not to say there aren't some really good effing bird tweets that are super fun. <laughs> 
And you know what? I will agree wholeheartedly, but I want to get back to mental health here because yeah. while we could, we could probably talk, we could probably do three hours. Heck, we could do a year on social media and the downfall of society just in yeah. the show itself. But I want to go back to prevention here because prevention is one of the big things that a lot of people always struggle with because the first step is always the hardest in any oh, journey, you know what? right? You go because ahead. it's boring. Prevention is boring. But not it to is... me. <laughs> It's, you know what, it's boring to brush your teeth every day, but we know we need to do it to, you know, prevent dental problems in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's some days where I don't have an appetite and don't, don't feel like making breakfast, but I'm like, I know I need to fuel my body and fuel my brain. So I'll just, you know, one of the things that I've done for myself in terms of prevention is this is off until I'm damn good and ready to use it. This is a tool. It is not, it is not a lifeline. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm like a 1960s housewife. I just, I get up in the morning, I make some breakfast, I do some yoga, I walk the dog, talk to my husband, you know, maybe chat with a friend, get myself ready and, you know, meditate. Like there's, there's a book I'm reading in the morning. So I do that. And then I get out my calendar. I'm like, what are my goals for the day? And then I can take five minutes and see if anything on here is going to inform my day. But that's what we need to do. So I'm, I go back to a friend of mine. Um, a friend of mine has, has Asperger's, so it's autism spectrum. And her and I were talking years ago about how she organizes her day. And I think this is just brilliant. It's just if we go back to this, I think we can resolve and prevent a lot of mental health issues because people will be focused on their own lives and not what's everyone else doing, you know? It, it's coming back to what do I need to do to look after myself and my family for the day? What are my, you know, what are, what are my responsibilities and my goals? So imagine having an empty jar. Well, if we don't intentionally and think about, you know, think about the things you need to do as rocks and pebbles and sand. If we don't intentionally put in there, I'm going to work on this project. I'm going to walk my dog for an hour. You know, I've got, you know, I've got this thing I need to do. If we don't intentionally put those rocks in, it is just going to get filled up with sand mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, social media, garbage, nonsense, TV, Netflix, whatever. It's just going to get filled up and there's going to be zero satisfaction. So I think part of mental health prevention is really thinking about what gives you satisfaction and contentment in life? What makes you feel good and accomplished at your job? Um, what makes you feel connected with your family? And those are the things we need to put in. So if you've got this empty jar, think about, okay, I need to make, um, I need to write this report. So I'm going to put that rock in. That's going to take me about two hours. So write it on my calendar, two hours on this. There's no, don't distract yourself during that time. Like only focus on that one thing. And then, oh, I want to, you know, make a stew for my family tonight. That's going to take me about 45 minutes prep. So then we put that in. Oh, I really need to get to the gym today. Great. I'm going to put that in. Or, you know, maybe there's a course you're taking or something, then you, then you do that. So you focus your time and your energy on the things important to you. And then we've got the, you know, the, the little pebbles to put in, like, you know, maybe you need to have some cereal for breakfast. Maybe you need to clean the bathroom. Maybe you need to, you know, do laundry, this, that, take this, do laundry, take this phone call, whatever, but there's still things that you need to choose to put in there. And then the sand trickles in. Yeah. You know, like I think about even if, like, for example, if I were to receive a phone call right now, I wouldn't answer it because my focus is here with you. I'm not going to split my focus. And I think that's one of the things with mental health is we've got all these fluctuations in our brain. Um, so I also, I also teach yoga. So um, we've got all these fluctuations. So I call the chitavritis in, um, in, 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 in uh, the practice that I do. So like, it's, it's like all these, you know, just these thoughts floating around. Well, what our brain needs, what our mental health needs is slow. 
and sustained. So we do one thing for a longer period of time without our concentration being, being split. And that helps to get our brain and our mental health going in one direction. So like, for example, I could walk my dog and talk on phone. I could do that, but it's not satisfying because I'm not paying attention to my dog. Um, I'm not enjoying the fresh air. I'm not looking at the trees. So I leave my phone at home or I stick it in my pocket and I'm like, right now I am walking my dog. And sometimes we have to talk to ourselves. Right now I'm washing the dishes. We can use it as a mindful meditation. I'm washing the dishes. I'm washing the dishes. I'm washing the dishes. I have to think about that right now. That's a tomorrow problem. I'm doing this. So one major thing for mental health is to focus on one thing at a time. And that's why I made the comment about like 1960s housewife. Imagine living on your own or even earlier than that, like being, being a pioneer. You lived on your own. You looked after your family. No social media, no phones, no nothing. You maybe saw your neighbors once a week if you went to church or went to town, you know, whatever. And so it was just living your life. Now, it seems like we're trying to live everybody else's life through social media, and it's not satisfying. You're missing out on your own. And there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a point in social media that you also pretend, right? We all pretend on social yep. media. We all, we all try to put that, that best foot forward on social media. Hey, look, this is what I'm wearing today. Well, okay. Tell me about your actual day. Tell me what actually happened in your day. What struggles did you have? And I find. Let's be real. That's exactly. And I, in this yeah. is, and I, I hate bringing this back up every single time on the show, but here it's my show. So I guess I get to in 2020, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. I struggled a lot in those first few months. Of course. Like there was of depression course. days. There were days that I just felt like I didn't want to go that on. It was a life changing diagnosis. And there was a moment there was a moment, and this is the moment my whole life changed. And it started me realizing how bad people pretend on social media. I was sitting there getting radiation, going through chemotherapy, and someone was bitching and complaining on social media that they couldn't go get groceries without putting on a fucking mask. Pardon my French. I know I shouldn't swear on the show, but I'm going to in this case. And the first thought I had, the first thought I had was if the biggest issue in your life right now is you have to wear a piece of fabric for 30 minutes to go pick up milk while people are dying and people are struggling every single day with cancer treatments, with radiation and chemotherapy, boy, I wish I had your life because dear God, you have a good compared to all these other people who are sitting around me right now with poison running through their veins. Sorry. <laughs> there, no, Chris, there, there's my mental health little tidbit for everyone. Before you tweet something, think about other people who are in worse situations right now. You have a roof over your head. You're getting money from the government, potentially through CERB. Anyway. No, I... I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Chris. Um, people, people have become really entitled and really stuck in their own way of being and are not, are not looking at the bigger picture. You know, I'll tell you what I saw on social media. I, I saw on Twitter today. So kids are really sick right now. Our children's hospitals are overrun. Uh, you know, doctors, nurses are speaking out about it. Kids are missing school, significant amount of illness right now. And someone had the audacity to put on one of my posts to, to tweet back at me. Well, how many children have actually died from COVID? Is it any, is it any more than children dying previously? And I'm like, are you seriously being that disrespectful about children potentially dying? Like I'm sitting here in my office seeing kids with migraines from having COVID, 
with, with terror, with afraid to go to school, afraid their parents are going to die. Um, some of them, a parent has died. Some of them, a family member has died. So they are, they are scared. And we need to look after our children and we need to look after our vulnerable and we need to open our hearts and our minds to there are people truly suffering and we need, if you're able, if you are able-bodied, you need to be helping them because our society is only measured by how well we look after our vulnerable. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I, I want to insert some profanity there because <laughs> I've got stuff going through my head, but you know what? I've already sworn enough for both of us there, <laughs> Angela. Yeah. You um, know what? Just if you can't like, honestly, I think about my grandma. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I agree wholeheartedly. That's why I don't tweet. The best way to stop someone from trolling you is to ask them to have a conversation with you. Then they'll run away with their tail between their legs. It's like, whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa. I, well, I'm willing I've to gotten, tweet it yeah. instead of actually talking to you now. Um, well, and my thought is if you if you don't have a real name on Twitter, I'm not talking to you. Yeah, that's true. If you can't put your real name there, yep. it's not happening. Amen to that, sister. I want to turn to one area that you talked about a little bit, but I, I want to dive into it a little bit more because the last two years has been tough. And I don't mean yes. mental health tough. I mean, financially tough for people. Yes. And there are people out there who don't have the means, the financial necessities mm -hmm. to get help. While there are uh, insurance coverages that do help you and are able to cover some uh, treatments and some psychologists like enough. yourself, it's not yeah. enough. It's not enough. What do we do now? Because that I think is a big obstacle for a lot of people who might be listening to this or might be trying to figure out how do I get help? How do I get help in a day mm -hmm. when I have to decide what's on the table or what's in my tank of gas to get to work? Because at the end of the day, mental health mm -hmm. is always at a backseat or your health is always at a backseat because you always have to look at roof, food, gas to get to or, or, or transit to get to and from work or even work so how do we Absolutely. help people who need help yeah you know what that is a really great question and you know i i want to be a person at the table um i want to be a person at the table who can help um answer those questions and collaborate and consult and say hey how how can we do this how can we make it better but what you just said is actually the foundation so imagine that I've got a pyramid here, okay? So if we think back to a hierarchy of needs is the very basis is we need to look after our physical health and safety. So exactly what you said, food on the table, roof over your heads, how can I get to work? How can I look after the kids, yeah. right? So we need to all, every single one of us needs to bring it back down to that level and then the next level after that is looking at the sense of belonging. So I think about what's happening, you know, with kids in school right now. Higher learning, education is way up here on the pyramid. We've got so many levels before that. We need to look at, you know, what is, what is the health and safety factor? What is belonging? And then the next is self-esteem and then creativity and then higher learning, right? And so we're, we're, we've gone from being up here-ish in society to we all have to come back down here and just look after the, the basics um, and, and have some, you know, some gratitude for that, right? Like, you know, I'm not, I, I don't get to do everything I want to do, but you know what? I'm so grateful for the roof over my head, for a loving husband. You know, we can put food on the table. We're good. We're good. And right? there's people out so, there who can't. So how do we help? Who can't? Exactly. exactly. Well, and how do we help people? Because we have a, and I, I don't, I, I hate turning things uh, political, but we have to do, we have to in this case, because the provincial government, the, exactly. The provincial government under Daniel Smith and Jason Copping are the health minister and the pr uh, premier of this province. Mm -hmm. What would you be telling them right now to try and help the vulnerable in our communities to get this help that they are so desperately needing when it comes to mental health? Well, I'll tell you the letter that I wrote to every single MLA um, just over a year ago was get your head out of the sand. 
get your head out of the sand. You are entitled. You have the responsibility and the privilege to be an elected person, elected representative to look after Albertans. And you need to do that. You need to listen. And you need to listen to the people on the front lines who know what is happening. And they have answers. They do you think they are? They know what needs to be done. Do you no. think? No. Okay. You know, I no, think they no, have no. the confirmation bias that they're listening to the people that are giving them the information they want to hear instead of listening to those of us that are saying we need to get back to just the basics for now. Like this idea of sovereignty, that is so high. Like that is such an entitled way of looking at the world when people are suffering. And so put that on the back burner. Let's look after what needs to be looked after right now with people's health, mental health, finances, so that maybe someday down the road that can be important. But right here, right now, that is not going to help people with sick kids. It's not going to help people put food on the table. Um, it's not going to help, you know, like, you know, I believe in small business entrepreneurs. However, when with businesses shut down and in and out, people don't have the space or the capacity or the finances for luxury right now. We have to just bring it back down to can we be grateful for this? And what we have, can we can we share with those with those who don't? And like I said earlier, it's not going to change until the people from the top believe that it's important. And I hear murmurings in the background of like, we need a revolution. You know, people, Albertans need to stand together and say, this is not, this is not who we are. This is who some people are, but this is not who we all are. And there are people that truly, truly want to help. And, you know, like I was thinking about it, I was thinking about it and, and, I think about like, let's think about Calgary 2013 when the floods happened. Everybody stopped and went and helped those in need. And just because this has been an invisible, invisible virus that impacts some people terribly and other people not, um, it impacts some families, you know, like financially, you know, with the shutdowns and everything and, and some people not so much. We have to say, okay, just everybody pause. What do we need to do to help those in need? And what do we need to do? And I'm not even going to say get things back on track because back is over. Like it's over. How can we move forward in a caring, compassionate, logical way that makes sense to help people get on their feet, help prevent further illnesses, you know, and like you said, seriously, if wearing a mask over your face for a short period of time to prevent illness in vulnerable people, you know, I had someone say, oh, I don't, you know, oh, I don't need to wear a mask. Everything's fine. And then they phone me later and say, um, actually, yeah, I, I got home and my child is really sick. So the truth is, we just don't know. It's not like a flood or planes crashing into a building. Um, it's not where we can visibly see it, but we need to feel it. You know, we're kind of in Jurassic Park right now. Like we literally are. We don't 100% know what's going on. There's way misinformation out there. There's people with these grandiose ideas about how great it is. And the truth is it's not. Agreed. People are hurting. They are, and a lot of people are hurting right now. I want to, I want to ask you a question, and I, 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 I know you are in a private practice, and I would never mm -hmm. want to tell you, ask you to give free advice to people, but I'm going to ask anyway because it's my show, and that's what I get to do. For those well, people, and I'm, and you know what, I am happy. I am happy to give best practice, broad best practice prevention and health promotion advice that is going to help the greatest amount of people possible. I am happy to do that. So let's do it then. So let's for those it. for those who are struggling right now, 
for those who may not be able to afford or get into, because that's, that's a whole nother issue that we haven't talked about is there are people, like you said, you're turning people away at your door saying, I would love to help you, but we can't, we're at capacity and you need to go to this person and they're basically pushing them off. That's our healthcare system. God bless it. Um, There are people struggling. There are people who are trying to get into the system, but can't. While they wait, while they try to navigate through this system, that is the Alberta Health Services slash uh, the mental health uh, uh, care, what advice, what help could you give them in just this brief moment in time and say, okay, while it may not help everyone, but this is a starting point. This is what you can do right here, right now to start working towards a better mental health. Yeah. I would say community. You need to find your people. And it can be one person, a couple people. It could be a free group. It could be a church group. Get around people and start making those connections there. You know, like I, I think about, I'm, I'm, met this met this sweet lady through Twitter. Um, we met in person. She was great. And now she's she's invited me to her, you know, virtual tea party. And I'm like, yes, that that is a meaningful and not just, you know, not just go out and do stuff, but meaningful connection. You know, I just reached out and talked with family that I haven't talked to for a while. I called some aunts and uncles and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? Call a family member, call a sibling. I mean, you may not be able to if they're conspiracy theorists and out in, you know, left field, but think about the people that you can connect with that aren't in left field. You know, I do, I do, I used to do coffee dates with people, you know, I'm, I'm staying out of enclosed spaces right now. So I go for walks. Um, I check in with, with a couple friends. I, it, it really, we really need to come back into community. You know, like I think, I think about some indigenous teachings that I've learned and it's about being in, being in circle together. Um, the Elizabeth Fry center in Calgary, for example, has both an in-person and I don't know if they're doing online right now, but they probably will again, but they have a women's drum circle with, with, teaching and sharing stories and and praying together and and learning learning together that is a beautiful sort of sense of community you know so we really do have a lot to learn in truth and reconciliation as well about being in community together and being respectful of everybody in the community together so that's what i would say and you know what else get a pet if you need to connect with an animal, if that's your source of connection, have a pet. If your source of connection is talking with your grandma every day, with your parents every day, you know, if there's one friend you can reach out to. Um, I can't say all the resources that are available because um, I don't know them all, but I can say there are groups waiting for you. I will say this, and I'm not trying to contradict you here, uh, Angela, but if you get a dog, if you get a cat, Make sure you keep that dog and cat. Make sure you're oh, willing. Yes. Please do not just get a COVID dog and then two like after the pandemic, get rid of them. A pet mm. is a lifelong, lifelong journey. Lifelong commitment. And do not yeah. think that it's a two or three year commitment because it's not. So that's my only You know what though? If you do, if you if you don't want to fully commit to a pet, foster a pet. Talk to one of the talk to one of the local foster and adoption agencies. See if you're a good fit. See if your home is a good fit. That's what I did. So I lost my dog, um, my my sweet beautiful dog Mira. I lost her in March, and I became severely depressed. And I decided I wasn't ready to fully commit. So I so I fostered a dog for a while. Um, and then of course when it came time for her to be adopted, I couldn't let her go. So Shana, now she's my forever. Aww. Now she's got her forever home. Sweetest little, sweetest little muffin. Um, but no, yeah. I, understandable there. No, exactly, I, exactly, I, exactly. I want to leave on this question, and this is going to be, and then I'll, I'll do my uh, wrap up here, Angela. And that is, I know you're at capacity right now. I know you're probably turning people away, but how can people follow you, reach out, 
ask you a question that they might, because you know what, as much as you're at capacity, you probably do take time from time to answer questions mm-hmm. that may come your way. Yeah. So how can people do that? Or they yeah. might say, Hey, can you recommend someone who's in the Northeast Calgary or the Southeast Calgary or Northwest Calgary? So because you probably know, there's probably a web of yeah. psychologists. And you know, all absolutely. The city. Oh, well, and, and the best, the best way to find, to find a psychologist is actually to go through the psychologist association of Alberta. Um, they have a referral source there. So that that's a great, a great thing to do, but people are always welcome. Like, go through my website, email me. That's what some people have done. Um, you know, I get DMs on Twitter. I appreciate those, but not the creepy ones. Don't send me anything creepy because you'll just get blocked. Um, yeah, you, pr- you probably don't get those so much. Hey, Chris, that's a whole, that's a whole other interview there. I, I, I'm just putting this out here. To deal with. Um, as a gay man, you would be surprised what I get. Oh, uh, Sorry. Sorry. I can't believe there's so many local single women in my area that really want to have fun with me. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> anyway. Oh, man. No. So the yeah, psych- so-, so there are resources that can help, but I will link mm-hmm. the link to the Alberta Psych- Psychology Association. Yeah, the, yeah I'll, I'll send it to you. The yeah, and I'll put it in the Alberta. show notes for those yeah. who want to check it out. But I'm also going to put in... Angela's contact as well, which is the yep. heartcentercounseling.com. Yep. Um, yep, for sure. Angela, a pleasure. I can't believe it's been an Thank hour, so but here we are. Oh an gosh. hour. <laughs> I know. That's the great thing about these long interviews. And, my, and do, do you know what? Actually, this, I really, I actually really appreciate this because I have had to turn people away and it just, it breaks my heart. I've never had to do that before. Like never. But when you, when you have boundaries and and you know your you know your personal limits, you know, you, you have to you have to do that. And so I appreciate this. And I I really hope, I really hope that like I, I call it planting seeds of goodness. So I hope that some of the seeds that I've planted will land on the people that need them. And I hope so as well. Um I want to thank you so much for uh, sitting down, chatting with me today. It was greatly appreciated. And I want to speak directly to the people who are listening and watching this right now. Put down social media. I say this at at the end of every single interview, and this one is no exception because this one is more prevalent than ever. Put down social media. Put down Twitter. Put down TikTok. Put down whatever social media you're on right now and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society. It helps our democracy. And yes, I'm going to divert here a little bit. It helps our mental health. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. 